All of the conversation you see publicly about the Class Act on solvency is addressing the same issue, regardless of whether people are supportive of the Class Act or not supportive of the Class Act. Everyone is pointing to this same issue. How do you make a voluntary, non-underwritten program solvent? And that is the hardest part of this law. Uh, that's the challenge that we keep working on and will only be successful and overcome if we have large numbers of individuals who enroll. Uh, and this is just basic insurance principles. As we move forward on continuing to try to figure this out, what, what we need, I think most, uh, those of us working on the program, is the continued public conversation about the need. That there is a reason to be having this conversation. This is very uh, challenging to try to figure out, you know, how can we do this in a way that's solvent in the long term, that provides the benefit. But there's a need for this benefit in this country. This would really help individuals. And how can we keep that public conversation going uh, about the fact that long-term supports are, are really critical. I had the chance to, to look at a, watch a focus group uh, of individuals up in Baltimore, and uh, we were, uh, I was behind them, one with the two-way mirror, and, and my favorite person, we had a group of women uh, in their 40s uh, talking about long-term services, and a group of men in their 40s, and the two, they were so different. I mean, a group of women talking about this and men talking about this was just, just startlingly different. It was, so, it was so different. And there was a man there who, um, fairly early in the conversation, came out as being gay, and uh, was talking about uh, his partner. And this guy described himself, well, he was overweight, and you know, he was obviously chubby. And, and we were talking about whether we could design a benefit that was short and fat. This became a description. He said, well, I'm short and fat. So he has self, he just described this guy. You look at him. He does not look healthy. And he said his plan for long-term care was that he had good genes. <laughs> And he said, my poor partner and his family members, they died early. He said, my family members died young. And it's kind of like, what's your cholesterol level? I mean, you're looking at this person who's admitted to being overweight, seems to be that way, and is saying, my plan, I got the data, 70 to 80% of us will need too long to support. My plan is that I've inherited good genes. So we have a lot to do to keep talking about the need for this, that this will impact all of us, all of our families, all of us. We've all seen, seen this in our own families and our own lives. We need to keep talking about the need. Uh, and, and regardless of whether it's a class conversation about the program, the continued focus on long-term supports is a women's issue, and we need to continue to talk about the need. Um, just in terms of the project time frame, the requirement in the law is that by October 2012, so a year and a half from now, the secretary must designate the final plan. The law is silent with regard to when we start enrolling people, but I would expect it to be soon after that. Uh, the earliest then that people could actually receive cash who paid in is 2018. This, like many other pieces of the Affordable Care Act, is a long lead event. It will take us a couple of years to get it launched, five years for people to pay in, and the earliest we could see cash is 2018. So someone who's needing long-term supports now can't wait to rely on the Class Act. But by 2018, this will have a fundamental change and provide fundamental um, opportunities for the aging network, for other providers in the community, uh, for workforce and labor issues so that we can provide additional assistance. So uh, keep watching, stay tuned, but help us all talk about the fact that long-term care is a serious issue. So I wanted to, I can, and I'll do Q&A on, on any of this. The other issue I just want to talk about in terms of the Affordable Care Act and women is prevention in, in a couple of different ways. I mean, the, the, the serious change in Medicare with regard to the uh, preventative services, the lack of copay, uh, the, the annual screenings, these are really important women's issues. Um, my main concern about them is that we make sure we get the word out to women and men both that these benefits are available. Uh, what we know from working with Medicare for many years is that there are often benefits available that people don't avail themselves of. So we need to make sure that people were accessing what they had and what they have now received starting January 1st in terms of uh, preventative benefits and screening. Uh, seniors on, on Medicare don't necessarily know now that these options are available and it's a public education and outreach campaign that will impact women. The other large prevention piece is the, is the big prevention fund that was included in health reform and the need to talk about prevention and older people. Uh, this is something that I think is um, uniquely challenging. Uh, as we look at prevention on any area, we 
you're talking about tobacco or chronic disease, um, AIDS, HIV, that we talk about older people. Because my concern is that it's fairly easy uh, when we talk about prevention to immediately think of children. And I think we should think of children. But my main objective and what I talk about with NHHS and publicly is we need a prevention agenda across the lifespan. And we must invest in children. But we must also, all of us who are advocating for older people, continue to talk about the lifespan. We need support for a 75-year-old who wants to stop smoking, just like a 15-year-old. And it's, it's fairly easy to uh, make the policy argument and make the case that it's worth investing in children because you get a lifetime of benefit. I absolutely agree. It's also not too late to invest in seniors. And this, this can't be seen as the, the dichotomy. You know, this is the right time, but it's too late for seniors. And unfortunately, there are times that people never say it that directly, but I sense that we have to continue to advocate to say it's never too late to stop smoking. It's never too late to manage your chronic disease. And, and it must be done for the health and longevity of seniors, and it also will save costs. Because if you looked at this just from a financial perspective, if you invest in, in, in youth, your return on investment will be decades away. If you help a senior keep from falling in their home, your financial return is immediate. Because they, if they fall, and you know how, uh, how a fall can change a senior's line, uh, that the financial return even is sooner. So it's good for people, it's good fiscal policy to continue to talk about prevention, whether it's Medicare or the other prevention benefits. Um, elder abuse. I uh, talk a lot to um, the aging network specifically that I am passionate about building a national agenda for community living. That, that all of us, and there are many movements over the last 50 years in this country that have been pointing and leading in the same direction towards choice in the community, the mental health movement, to deinstitutionalize certain people in the community, seniors, the rebalancing of long-term supports, the disability community, both in terms of people with physical disabilities and developmental disabilities. We don't warehouse people. Uh, these four movements have really come together to start shaping and informing each other. Uh, and I think the Affordable Care Act kind of brings all that together, stitches it together, and advances the cause for community living. That this is the place to deliver services. It's a person-centered approach. It's a financially responsible approach. But let's serve people in the community. I am not anti-nursing home, and I've been to bad ones, and I was the nursing home regulator in Kansas, but I've also been to places that were holistic and supportive. I believe in the culture change movement. I believe we need to have skilled, congregate nursing care as an alternative to people. If people want to stay at home, and I think we need to do everything we can to support them. If we get on this bandwagon, this is it. We gotta, we gotta drive hard to community living. We must address elder abuse. Because we will have increasing numbers of people uh, who are old, alone, and vulnerable. And I love talking about family caregiving issues. I've been uh, to family caregiver conferences. I had the wonderful opportunity to meet the former First Lady Rosalind Carter, uh, at her caregiving institute and in Georgia. Caregiving is a wonderful thing to talk about, but we must talk about elder abuse when we talk about caregiving.